The world is addicted to fossil fuels. I would encourage you to let that sink in for a moment. We are totally dependent on a limited and non-replenishable resource that requires constant attention and refinement and is driven by profit. And we need our fix of fossil fuels in so many ways to keep producers producing, manufacturers manufacturing, supply chains flowing, money changing hands and economies churning. And when the cost of a gallon gets as high as it is today with no clear endpoint in sight, the repercussions that are felt in every facet of your life and far beyond just the shock at the price of the pump when you try to fill up your car. And every raw material derived from fossil fuels, such as fertilizers, the plastics, they're all affected. And while you may be wrestling with whether that road trip vacation is feasible this year, behind the scenes, the economy is having severe withdrawals from the high cost of gas. In this video, we're gonna examine what is determining the high prices any solution that might be out there, the hidden ways that will change your life forever, and what even the experts are recommending that you do at this time. And I do have to warn you up front that things are likely to get a whole lot worse than they already are, and far worse than they're currently predicting. So let's talk about it. Download the Start Preparing Survival Guide to help you prepare for any disaster. I'll post a link in the description and comments section below, or visit cityprepping.com forward slash get started for a free guide to help you get started on your journey of preparedness. The gas price is determined by these costs and profit factors, cost to produce oil, cost of refining oil, distribution, and taxes. It is a pretty easy cost breakdown, but even with all those costs, the gas price can be hugely out of sync with the actual factors. Any threatened war with Iran, Russia, or other large oil producing countries, and the price will shoot up. Any storm or platform or refinery closure, and the price will also shoot up. The price shot up when the Colonial Pipeline was shut down after a cyber attack. Any threat at all, real or imaginary, and the price will shoot up, and it rarely comes back down. When it does, it never goes below where it was. Still, politicians and pundits will tell you that they have a solution. What they're not telling you is that there isn't any easy alternative, nor a quick fix to the addiction to oil and gas. Simply eliminating state and federal taxes is more of a political talking point than any real relief. It would only drop your $100 price at the pump by around about $10. I know we could take that relief, but my point is that it isn't the total solution. Neither is opening up the strategic reserves or drilling our way out of the problem. Countries could drill more, produce more, and empty their strategic reserves, but that oil isn't necessarily destined for the country it comes from. International contracts and even higher paying countries would be the market for the abundance of barrels of oil. So profits would remain high for global oil companies, but there's not really any relief for customers. Since the 1970s, OPEC's ability to keep demand low and prices high were realized. OPEC, or the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries, is a massive oil cartel that represents 13 member countries, which are responsible for about 40% of the global crude oil production. OPEC states also hold 80% of the world's international reserve of oil. In 1973, Secretary of Commerce Peter Peterson remarked, The era of low-cost energy, it's almost dead. That statement, it could be revised today to say that the era of low-cost energy is completely dead. With Russia invading Ukraine, the resulting sanctions and embargoes, and the strain on global oil supply, OPEC only sees dollar signs. It took them months to begrudgingly agree to increase production. And that oil is still far removed in time from the gallon of gas you get at the pump. They could triple output, and it would be weeks and months before you ever realize any positive change at the pump. The U.S. is the top oil producer on Earth, producing about 11.5 million barrels per day. Russia comes in at number two, producing about 10.5 million barrels daily. There are 129 refiners in the United States with the total output capability of refining 18 million barrels per day. Unfortunately, we use almost 21 million barrels per day. It is cheaper to ship crude oil than to refine it and transport it as fuel. If you even do the most uncomplicated math on the problem, you can see that demand remains high, supply remains low, and the costs, it can only go up. The president cannot simply give an order and suddenly refineries would double their output. Knowing that there is an addictive demand for their product, these massive oil conglomerates are allowed to focus on retaining profits for their shareholders, wherever in the world they are investing from. 
opening or establishing a pipeline for oil that won't end up in your country's supply, or drilling more oil that won't actually end up in your country make for really just cute soundbite one-liners for politicians and pundits to chant on your favorite evening news platform, but they don't solve any tiny iota of the problem. In fact, Profiting by producers, refiners, distributors, retailers, and politicians results in high prices regardless of the real factors of the production, refinement, and distribution. It's not a simple supply and demand formula anymore. Demand, it outstrips supply and is enhanced by perceived threats to the supply. All the while, profit-seeking drives the price higher and higher. Is there a solution? Sure. We have to lessen our dependence, find alternative forms of energy, conserve energy, reduce consumption, eliminate taxes on fuel, increase production, and retain what our country produces, increase refinery output, and pray that wars, weather, or oil spills don't derail our effort. The problem is, for that price to go down, we have to be doing all of those things, all at the same time, all around the world. Every country has to want to do that, and that's not likely to happen. You're probably wise enough to know that when prices go up, they rarely ever come down. Remember when gas was under $2? Remember when a $6 burger was simply a name and not the actual cost? Obviously, the most direct impact is realized when you go to fill your tank at the gas station. You are the end user and you need gasoline to get from point A to point B, home to work, work to home, to the grocery store, kids practices, and the list, it goes on and on. The average American commutes 27.6 minutes to work every day. Whether they do that in their own car, a moped, carpooling, or via public transportation, that is using gas. The high cost of fuel oil also puts pressure on alternatives. Natural gas and solar prices go up as people seek other means to heat their homes and run and power their lives. Maybe they heat their homes with fuel oil or liquid natural gas. Maybe they cool their homes with the 2,504 billion kilowatt hours of electricity produced from fossil fuels in the United States. So the apparent costs are clearly seen at the pump and when the utility bills come. There are factors that determine whether staying employed to break even or even endure a consistent loss outweighs the potential insecurity of finding new employment closer to home. So here are the often overlooked actual costs of higher fuel prices. Number one dragging economy. Workforce and employment numbers are an often overlooked side effect of higher gas prices. Precisely when economies are struggling to regain their footing and recover from the pandemic lockdowns and repeated supply chain disruptions, millions are determining whether employment in a job that doesn't make ends meet is tenable for the future. This will increase the ranks of the unemployed while also pumping the brakes on the economy. Put your hopes for an economic recovery off for the next year or two at the very best. Number two, higher production costs. When fuel prices go up, the cost of production goes up. Whether you are mining silver or growing corn, it simply does not matter. Raw materials require low-cost fuel to remain profitable. When the cost of generating the raw materials and getting those materials to manufacturers and consumers outweighs profit, farmers, for example, they opt not to grow and companies scale back production even as demand remains high. High demand and lower output results in price increases and even outright shortages. Number three, higher manufacturing costs. Even if that farmer grows corn for feed and gets it to the rancher and to the local factories, fuel-related costs are associated with the next phase manufacturing. The manufacturers have to process these raw materials into usable consumer products. Low-cost fuel is required to get the materials to the plant, process them, and distribute the final product to stores and retailers. High-priced fuel results in scaling back operations or raising prices or even both even as consumer demand remains high or increases. Number four, higher retail costs. When production, manufacturing, and distribution costs increase for every imaginable product or service, you can only imagine that retail prices on everything go up to maintain profits. Nobody retails anything at cost, or there simply will not be any value in selling anything. Markups can range from 1% to 1,000% or more, but there's always a markup. The cost of producing the oil, paying workers, taxing the oil, supplying manufacturers, manufacturing usable products, and getting those products to markets and consumers gets passed on to, you guessed it, the consumer. This can result in supply failures, shortages, panic buying, and lopsided supply and demand models. In a nutshell, the cost of every single thing in an oil-driven and oil-dependent economy goes up and up and up. Number five, breakdown of fundamental services. When manufacturers scale production on chemicals essential for water treatment, municipal water prices go up. 
When the fossil fuel prices goes up, utility prices go up. With peaking demand and reduced supply, the chance of grid failure is more significant. The parts needed to maintain a healthy power grid are often sourced overseas. With supply chains continuing to struggle, it's really only a matter of time when the components required for a healthy grid are no longer available. Fossil fuels are non-renewable and they're required for all of the other fundamental utilities and services that you and everyone else has become dependent upon since the first three-phase alternating current power transmission at 110 kilovolt took place in 1907 between Croton and Grand Rapids, Michigan. So, beyond the apparent price at the pump and the fact that there is no easy solution to plug in, you can expect large and small breakdowns, from producing resources to manufacturing to distribution to end users and basic services. And I'll tell you what, and I'll be honest, it's not looking good. The short answer is no. As I mentioned, there's not really a solution to fossil fuel addiction. As I mentioned at the beginning of the video, things are about to get a whole lot worse than it already is, and far worse than they're currently predicting. Profits, they're going to be maintained by scaling production to always maintain a demand imbalance. After all, what can you do about it? Go solar or buy an electrical vehicle? And those panels, they all require fossil fuels, mining, manufacturing, and distribution to create. And the same is true for the electric car, but it also requires fossil fuels to get it charged for the most part. The world has realized a heyday of manufacturing and distribution, but that's all changing in real time. So what can we expect over the next several years when it is clear that we will not see costs coming down? If we can draw any parallels between the economic downturn of the 1973 OPEC oil embargo and today, Respecting that the situations are different in many ways and consumption and demand are astronomically higher today than it was then, several specific outcomes become apparent. Expect businesses to have to scale back or shutter operations altogether. And this means less output during a period of high demand. This means workers are going to get laid off, prices will increase, and the economic crisis will worsen. And this will happen through this year and next, and the Fed will probably try and raise interest rates to counter inflation. At the time of recording this video, they just announced the largest single interest rate hike in over 28 years. Additional rate hikes are inevitable because it's one of the only control tools that they have left at their disposal. However, this won't do much to really slow down the speed at which money is lent. Fewer people will be buying land or property, especially since most are priced out of that market altogether. Inflation is already deeply entrenched in our economy. The lowest estimates put consumer prices up 8.6%, but that's the rosiest of rosiest visions. The reality is that prices have gone up far past that. Next for our economy and most of the world economies is probably a recession. If we're not already there by definition, we will soon be. Fed officials recently projected the economy would grow just about 1.7% this year, down from the 2.8% growth rate that they predicted three months ago. By 2023, expect that the economy to contract even further. And there's really no soft landing anymore in the forecast. Imagine that the economy is standing on its tippy toes on a ledge. We're all just one natural disaster or one conflict away from a much larger collapse at this point. So I have to tell you that no single policy or plan, no pundit or political party change, no increase in drilling or ramped up production is enough to dig our way out of this one. When world leaders are coming out and acknowledging the possibilities of food and power shortages, there's a problem far worse than that rounding the corner. So we can't actually tell what will be the catalyst to change our trajectory or how far into the future that change will come. But that doesn't leave us entirely without a plan. In fact, it presents us with a very specific opportunity. Your plan should be to prep to protect yourself from the world's failings. Knowing that supply chains will continue to falter, take steps to build food reserves and reduce your dependence on global food supply chains. Get local where you can and produce, process, and preserve at least some small percentage of what you need to consume. Knowing that the energy grid, which is already highly prone to failure, is probably going to get even more susceptible to prolonged outages, I would encourage you to prep your energy needs. Learn to do with less or no energy at all and understand how this chaos will impact the world around you, your state, your town, or even your neighborhood. Understand that to survive, you will need to fundamentally change your spending habits. Necessities and essentials, they have to take center stage in your budget. And before this is over, the recession unfortunately will get worse. 
Before this is over, millions of jobs will be lost. Whole economies may implode. The high fuel costs coupled with food shortages is a formula with only one outcome. It's really hard to fathom the more profound consequences of $7 or $10 a gallon of gas. It's challenging to comprehend the deeper, life-altering complications when we are in slack jaw sticker shock at the pumps. But there are numerous side effects to that per gallon price. We are in uncharted waters. Economies around the world, they're going to suffer and some will even collapse. Even investment gurus who I've mentioned on the channel before, such as Robert Kiyosaki, author of the book Rich Dad Poor Dad, he advised his 1.9 million Twitter followers just yesterday to invest in cans of tuna fish and baked beans. He wrote this, best investments are cans of tuna and baked beans. You can't eat gold, silver, or Bitcoin. You can eat cans of tuna and baked beans. Food is most important. Starvation next problem, invest in the solution. Even he is becoming a prepper, it appears, and he's also a new prepper who would be making a mistake by limiting his prepping to just hoarding cans of beans and fish. Don't make this mistake, but work from a complete plan like what I outline in my Prepper's Roadmap course. I'll post a link to it in the description section below. For your part, double down on your food and water preps, but do realize that the world is about to do the same. Take it a step further and reduce dependencies and start producing part of what you consume. Think beyond just gas, wheat, corn, electricity today and prepare for a better tomorrow for yourself. We've grown accustomed and really desensitized to rising fuel costs over the last 50 years. But trust me when I say this, this time it's different. We're really driving into a storm here. Visibility is about to drop to zero and the clouds, they don't really show any signs of clearing up anytime soon. The prepping choices that you make today will influence your path and where it ultimately leads you. As always, please stay safe out there.